committee will now come to order. That was good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Yeah, you, you bang that gavel and everybody is yeah. quiet. That's pretty neat. Uh, chair will now recognize himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Subcommittee on Communication and Technologies hearing on empowering and connecting communities through digital equity and internet adoption. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today to discuss this very important topic. Today we will hear about the challenges of internet adoption that go beyond the lack of access. All too often we talk about how many Americans don't have access to broadband and discuss the resources necessary to close that gap. But the far more insidious threats are those who have broadband available to them but don't sign up or those that don't have the basic skills to use digital technologies. Our witnesses today will discuss the range of challenges these folks face, the risks we face by leaving millions of people behind, and a range of potential solutions. Among the principal barriers faced by these communities are affordability, digital literacy, and access to devices. First off, internet access is expensive, and when cost-constrained consumers are forced to choose between mobile and home internet, they often go mobile only. Millions of them, though, forego both. Internet and mobile service can cost hundreds of dollars a month. That's the equivalent of a car payment. In effect, many of us are essentially buying our ISP a new car every five years. This is a very serious challenge to adoption, particularly in households making less than $35,000 a year. Adoption uh, numbers in are even lower in low-income rural communities. So, finding ways to close the affordability gap is just one part of closing the digital divide. Another key piece to this puzzle is digi digital literacy and training, and ensuring that people have the skills, understanding, and confidence to use technology and get connected. Organizations like the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and their partners like Computer Reach, based in Pittsburgh, have long worked to provide digital literacy training and provide access to low-cost devices and technology. These programs help engage communities and provide folks with pathways, not just to get connected, but to leverage that connectivity to educate and empower themselves and their family members. So whether it's being able to apply for jobs, enabling kids to do homework, connecting seniors to telehealth services or veterans to support communities, these digital inclusion programs are often essential for opening people's eyes to the importance of and the opportunities presented by getting online. Increasingly, digital literacy isn't just the ability to use a computer, but it's a fluency in technology. And as we look at manufacturing sectors, jobs that used to be based entirely on manual tasks are being supplanted by interacting with digital tools and systems. And employment in those sectors require a level of basic fluency just to get your foot in the door. The same is true for uh, many other industries that are evolving as technology changes in the way people work. In rural communities where the adoption is low, these programs are particularly important. They can upskill the workforce with the basic tools to use digital technologies. We see this in factories in Pittsburgh with robotics, but we also see it in rural America with precision agriculture. While the nature of these industries hasn't changed, the tools people are using have, and we need to ensure that folks in our communities have the basic skills to use them. I'm not talking about high schoolers. I'm talking about people who have done these jobs most of their lives, but haven't needed to use or interact with these new technologies. The same is true with telehealth services. For seniors who are homebound or who want to remain in their homes, these services are a lifeline. But for many of them, digital literacy and access to affordable devices remains a barrier to adoption of these new technologies. We also see this problem manifest itself in schools with the homework gap. Our educators are working to integrate technology into the curriculum, but many students lack access to home internet. When your teacher is assigning your homework that you need and you need to go online just to see what the assignment is or to complete it, lack of internet access is a cruel stumbling block. We have all heard stories about children sitting in cars outside of fast food restaurants and libraries to get on Wi-Fi or parked in overlooks that can get a trickle of broadband. We can't afford to let this generation fall behind. 
These children are our nation's future, and we need to find ways to close the homework gap for them and for ourselves. It's my hope that we can have a productive discussion about the challenges faced by all of our communities and come to some consensus on solutions that can help close the digital divide. As I've said before, I stand ready to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to come up with real solutions to address these challenges. Uh, I thank you all for being here today, and I really look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to recognize my good friend, Mr. Latta, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for his five-minute opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding today's hearing. And thanks to our witnesses for appearing before us today. We really appreciate your time for being here. One of the great stories that is a success out there that has provided a building block for Internet adoption and its widespread deployment is the success of Wi-Fi. As co-chair of the Wi-Fi Caucus, I understand the role Wi-Fi has played in bringing internet connectivity into millions of homes across the country. Under a light touch approach, the first set of flexible rules put in place in the early 2000s paved the way for an explosion of broadband expansion. This deregulatory framework helped uh, democratize the internet so that millions can enjoy the benefit it brings. Since then, hundreds of billions of dollars of investment has poured in and new networks have been built across the country. Many companies have made great strides over the last decade to connect millions of low-income households to high-speed broadband. While this committee's efforts have largely focused on promoting broadband deployment, the private sector has recognized that there is a great value in connecting the unconnected, not only for its own business interests, but for the communities they serve. Yet. Some Americans remain unconnected. Over the last decade, we have focused on closing the remaining gaps in broadband deployment so that every American, no matter where they live, can have access to the Internet. While unfortunately too many remain without an option at all, some who have access to the Internet still do not subscribe. As I'm sure we'll hear today, there are a variety of reasons why some people choose not to adopt broadband service. We can debate these reasons, and my hope is that the data and research can shed some light on that today. But as we consider the potential for new federal programs of legislation, I urge caution that we are not focusing on a one-size-fits-all solution with the heavy hand from Washington. Our focus should be on putting consumers first by allowing them the flexibility to choose an Internet plan that meets their needs, if any plan at all. I also ask that we carefully consider whether there is a need for an expanded federal role at a time when state and local governments continue to make strides, providing willing consumers with the tools to connect to the Internet. As we will hear today, many states are working hard to serve their communities in ways that the federal government could never do from Washington. To the extent more action is needed, it would be helpful to hear what state programs have been successful at providing options to consumers. While everyone operates in a resource-constrained environment, we should better understand the existing problems and solutions operating today before simply throwing more money at a problem that we may not fully understand. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the Chair is now going to recognize Mr. McNerney for Mr. Pallone's five minutes. We'll yield to you. All right, thank the Chair for this. Uh, this is truly a bipartisan issue, and I I'm looking forward to working with members on both sides of the aisle to make some progress here. Um, my district is close to Silicon Valley, but the economic opportunities are starkly different between my district uh, and Silicon Valley, which is 40 miles away. However, the seeds of opportunity are already being planted. For example, I recently visited, visited a coding school and a startup incubator to see adults learning skills that are going to be able to provide them a tremendous economic opportunity. Uh, it was truly amazing to see uh, a, a darkened classroom uh, with people working hard. Uh, the big shots walked in, and they didn't even notice us. They didn't care we were there. They were interested in, in learning their coding skills. So that was impressive. Uh, also, uh, the largest city in my district, Stockton, California, has developed an AI strategy. So uh, there are the seeds for improvement. But the reality is that many of my constituents still lack the digital skills to get ahead or even to get by in today's economy. Many don't even have broadband at home, even though they often live in an area that has broadband deployed nearby. As a result, there's a wealth of opportunity that, uh, for my constituents that remains largely untapped. And this is the case for many communities across the country, rural and urban. 
That's why I introduced H.R. 4486, the Digital Equity Act, legislation that would create a federal grant program to close gaps in broadband adoption and digital literacy. We are long overdue for closing these gas, gaps. So I asked my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, both rural and urban districts, do you have constituents that are being left behind the digital divide? If so, work with me to pass this legislation and open up economic opportunity and prosperity for every American. With that, I'm going to yield to the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan. Thank you, Mr. McNerney, and I want to thank the witnesses for testifying to Chairman Pallone and Doyle, Ranking Members Walden and Lotta for today's hearing on digital equity. I want to focus on what FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel has called the cruelest part of the digital divide, the homework gap. We know that seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires access to broadband. Unfortunately, we also know that millions of students lack access at home or in their communities. Um, as Mr. McNerney laid out, even if broadband is able to be connected to, it's unaffordable. It's unaffordable, it's out of reach. More students though, who don't have any connectivity, they find themselves in parking lots, at fast food restaurants or high schools across the country, sometimes sitting on the sidewalk in the dark at night, because that's the only place they can get access to free internet. Keep up with the homework. If air travelers could have internet access at 30,000 feet flying across the world, why in the hell can't we connect on the ground in these rural communities? Nobody's been able to answer that question. Let's close the gap. Let's find some answers, and let's find a way to work together in a bipartisan way. I yield back. Gentlemen, and yields back. Uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, recognize Mr. Walden, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for doing this hearing. I think it's really an important one. We're going to hear some uh, interesting testimony for our witnesses. We all appreciate uh, you being here and sharing your, your wisdom with us, how we can uh, connect America better. We all know that the Internet has truly transformed uh, the lives of people throughout uh, the world. It plays a central role in how Americans conduct business, how we interact, how we make daily decisions. Uh, under a light-touch regulatory framework, uh, the Internet has really thrived, providing Americans access to numerous services, serving as the single most important driver of economic growth and job creation. While the Internet has been uh, largely adopted in a relatively short span of time, if you think about human history and the enormous revolution uh, the Internet's brought, uh, there are still millions of Americans who do not have access to the Internet in their homes, as you're hearing from all of us, and especially those of us uh, who represent these big, sweeping, wide-open uh, rural districts, but it's also an issue in urban uh, cities as well. In some cases, it's because high-speed broadband's not been deployed, an issue this committee's focused on in a bipartisan way for many years. And while we have made progress in promoting broadband deployment, particularly in rural areas, we all know there are many Americans who remain uh, unconnected, even if they do have access to broadband service options. Recognizing this issue, some companies have made important strides over the last decade to connect millions of low-income households to high-speed broadband. For example, the Internet Essentials Program, developed by one service provider, offers high-speed broadband at an affordable price, and they've seen great success. It has connected 8 million people in over 2 million households, more than I, I dare say a federal program would likely achieve in the same period of time. It provides opportunity and access for low-income individuals. Um, we must make sure that our policies allow for continued experimentation in the marketplace with ways to promote broadband adoption as well. It should be noted that where there are gaps in adoption, state and local governments have also been a big part of the team and, and have provided uh, good work at, uh, to support and, and reach out to their communities. They have firsthand knowledge of the challenges uh, their communities face, and we work with, uh, with their resources. They have to find uh, creative solutions. I'm excited to have witnesses here today that can talk about some of the innovative work that's being done at the local level to address the adoption issue. I think it's an important one. But let us not put the, the cart before the horse. In many parts of the country, especially frontier communities like those in eastern Oregon, broadband availability remains elusive. Uh, recently, we were in John Day, my staff and I, doing some meetings, and uh, it's in the really central part of my district in, in, in a pretty isolated area. I think the nearest stoplight's five hours away or something. Um, not making that up, by the way. Um, they had really limited internet service, 
uh, and intermittent internet service. And uh, just to put it in perspective, when we finished our meetings, uh, we decided we better gas up before we left town. And we had to pay with cash because the internet was down. They couldn't process the credit cards. Uh, more of an inconvenience, yes. Good thing we had cash. Um, but it's no way to do business. And we've been working uh, with the USDA and others to, to get some money in there and, and figure out uh, uh, the various uh, problems. It, it's only been a decade since broadband deployment has exploded into an everyday necessity. And without first addressing the lack of broadband availability, any federal resources put forward for broadband adoption could further enlarge the digital device, the divide if not done uh, carefully. Uh, obviously, we have, still have issues with mapping um, that uh, various FCCs have, have, have wrangled with for decades, and uh, we're all trying to get it right. Uh, to be sure, today's hearing will hopefully bring data to the discussion so we can get a better understanding of barriers to broadband adoption. I'm, I'm happy we're following regular order and holding a hearing to examine the breadth of the issues uh, on such an important topic. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, thanks for doing this. We look forward to working with you on this and other communications issues going forward. And again, thanks to our witnesses, and I yield back a full minute. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Uh, Ms. Angela Seifer, Executive Director, National Digital Inclusion Alliance, welcome. Mr. Joshua Edmonds, Director of Digital Inclusion, City of Detroit, Michigan, welcome, sir. Ms. Rosalind Layton, Visiting Scholar, American Enterprise Institute, welcome. Ms. Gigi Son, a, a regular uh, uh, here on, on our panels. Uh, Gigi, it's good to have you here. Uh, she is a distinguished fellow with Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law and Policy, welcome. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Jeffrey Sorrell, Director of Broadband Infrastructure Office, North Carolina Department of Information Technology. Uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us here today. We look forward to your testimony. Uh, I will be recognizing each of you for five minutes to provide your opening statements. Uh, before we begin, uh, we have a, is the lighting system there to be seen? Uh, we have this lighting system that I want to tell you about. Uh, when you first start, you'll notice a green light. Uh, and uh, you can continue speaking and you'll see the light turn yellow. That means you have one minute to wrap up your opening statement. And when that light turns red, your chair falls down through a shoot. No, when your light turns red, you should, you should stop talking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so we're going to get started. So uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, Ms. Seifer, you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Your microphone. You have to press the button. That wasn't part of the instructions. <laughs> uh, Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, Ranking Member Walden, esteemed members of the committee. Uh, my name is Angela Seifer. I'm the Executive Director of the Digital, National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I'm here representing NDIA and our affiliates, and Computer Reach in Pittsburgh also thanks you for us being here. Uh, Twenty-some years ago, I was, in, uh, I was a grad student in Toledo, Ohio, and we were I was setting up computer labs, I was teaching people how to use Word, I was um, organizing meetings, and we thought of our work as bridging the digital divide. Our focus was on computers and computer training. In 1996, we were not concerned with internet access. If we had just two computers in a lab that were connected to the internet, we thought we were cutting edge. Today, folks on the ground who are bridging the digital divide are facilitating access to home internet service, devices, and digital literacy training. They are nonprofit organizations, libraries, governments, housing authorities, and more. They are the heroes. NDIA represents over 400 of these affiliated organizations in 41 states, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. NDIA's positions are based on our affiliates' on the ground experience and research. I would like to address a few myths today. Myth number one there's a misstatement that's often repeated that the digital divide would be bridged if we just fill the rural broadband infrastructure gaps in the US. According to the census latest American Community Survey, about 14 million urban households in major metro areas as well as smaller cities and towns, and four million rural households still lacked broadband subscriptions of any kind, including mobile data plans. What did 60% of the unconnected urban households have in common with more than half of the unconnected rural households they all had household incomes below 35,000. 
Households with income incomes less than 35,000 make up 28% of US households, but they account for 60% of those without any broadband internet service. We do need to address the lack of broadband infrastructure in rural areas, but it's just one barrier to individuals and communities being able to fully participate in society today. The other common barriers, no matter where one lives, are the cost of internet service and devices plus digital literacy skills. Simpli simplistically equating the digital divide with just one of these barriers increases the division in our country. Myth number two. No worries, the excitement around 5G says that we'll just, that'll solve the digital divide. 5G will not solve the digital divide. Current broadband technologies were not deployed to all neighborhoods unless local governments mandated such. There's no reason to think 5G will be any different. Additionally, 5G as a broadband service requires 5G capable devices. Low income households struggling to pay for internet service will certainly not rush out to purchase a 5G enabled device. Myth number three, well intentioned individuals have stated that if we can convince non adopters of the value of the internet, they would certainly subscribe. Anyone who has resisted using the internet quickly realizes that the internet cannot be avoided. When you apply for a job, register for classes, or even to find out what your social security benefits are. The greatest barrier to broadband adoption is not relevance. It is cost in digital literacy. Residential internet service in the US is expensive. On the low end, internet service generally runs 65 to $70 per month. That's a lot of money. Unfortunately, I can't provide more detail as to the cost of internet service because the data doesn't exist. We need the FCC to begin collecting data on the cost of home internet service and make it publicly available. In the US, digital literacy training is undervalued and underfunded. One third of manufacturing workers lack proficient digital skills. Half of all construction, transportation, and storage workers lack proficient digital skills. There is no funding ded dedicated to digital literacy training in the US. It has been left up to local governments libraries and nonprofits to piece together resources to address the basic digital skills training that millions, <coughs> millions of Americans need to cross that digital divide. Piecing together funding is the wrong strategy for a strong workforce. Now let me share some good news. Digital inclusion solutions in the US have been crafted from the ground up. NDIA's affiliates are providing guidance to low-income parents connecting to their children's teachers, teaching seniors how to use their electronic health records, helping veterans learn digital skills to acquire a job, and help enabling disabled adults to participate more fully in their communities. We know that trust is an important factor. Technology can be quite intimidating. The most successful digital inclusion programs are rooted in the communities being served. What is missing? Digital equity planning at the state level and financial support for that planning plus the implementation. A good first start would be to pass the Digital Equity Act. We are also in need of increased awareness of the problem and the solutions. So thank you. This hearing is increasing awareness. You are increasing awareness. Thank you very much. We now recognize Mr. Edmonds for five minutes for your opening statement. Honorable Chairman, Ranking Member, and Committee Members, my name is Joshua Edmonds, and on behalf of the City of Detroit, I would like to express a sincere thanks for the opportunity to discuss digital equity and internet adoption two issues that are critical for the residents that I serve. These issues transcend specific geographies and demographics and have a far-reaching impact on our great nation. Digital equity is a commitment for the least of us. It requires an honest assessment of what diverse populations need to achieve meaningful participation in a digital society. At the core of any digital equity initiative is the understanding of the plight of older adults, veterans, low-income families, disabled residents, small business owners, and unemployed Americans, all seeking to engage in an increasingly digital world. As the City of Detroit's Director of Digital Inclusion and as a Digital Inclusion Policy Fellow uh, within the Poverty Solutions Initiative at the University of Michigan, I'm responsible for developing a digital equity strategy that will sustainably increase internet, subs internet subscribers while placing an emphasis on digital skill training and resident device acquisition. I play a vital role in implementing digital equity initiatives for a city where one in four residents still do not have broadband access of any kind. Every American city has digital inequity of some type, yet none of us receive any federal funding beyond infrastructure to address the issue. On the topic of digital protection, 
Over 200,000 res residents utilize Detroit Public, Detroit Public Library's Wi-Fi networks, oftentimes in parking lots and after hours. This example is not specific to Detroit. Many residents in underserved communities are unaware of how to protect themselves online. This is a problem with implications tied to our national security. For Americans with Disabilities, uh, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the passing for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Unfortunately, Americans with disabilities are less likely to have home broadband and technical devices. With more than 56 million Americans living with a disability, investments in digital equity will ensure Americans with disabilities are afforded the same opportunity to digitally engage in today's economy, regardless of their geographic location. On the topic of the census, due to our broadband challenges, the Associated Press uh, listed Detroit as the toughest community to count in America. U.S. cities are at an increased risk on missing out on our share of the $1.5 trillion in federal resources. If the federal government is using the internet as a vehicle to determine population sizes to ultimately allocate funding, that same federal government should also provide resources for communities to boost broadband adoptions and to ensure an accurate count. That's fair. Strategic partnerships can really help reduce the digital divide. At the city, I also work directly with internet service providers in varying capacities. While my role can be very challenging, most of the providers have been great partners. When the city recognized Digital Inclusion Week this past October, Comcast was one of our first sponsors with additional support from Verizon and AT&T. Uh, this past holiday season, when working with Los Angeles-based social enterprise, Human IT, and the Detroit Housing Commission, we were able to, to provide 75 families with free computers. I made one phone call to Comcast. Uh, asking for them to provide those same 75 families with six months of free internet. They obliged. These are small examples of how local leadership has called on industry to fill in where the federal government is silent. In Detroit, we have developed public-private partnerships without any government funding, but it is an unsustainable model. We need federal resources to continue our work. If we were to receive federal funding, we could do more robust outreach and incentivize more localized funding from philanthropic organizations. In conclusion, the city of Detroit has stories that are familiar to thousands of cities and towns across the United States that are starving for digital opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard on a national level. I hope my testimony serves as a launch pad that will spur digital equity investment that gives American communities the footing needed to compete in the digital economy. The digital divide is an, an indiscriminate issue that ironically connects all of us. We need leaders at all levels within all sectors to really work together on this issue. I realize I have 40 seconds left, so I can return that. <laughs> you're, you're, you're to be commended, Mr. Edmonds. Uh, that, that's going to get you a long way in this committee. Dr. Layton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. I wanted to say I'm a native of Pittsburgh, and I would like to make a shout out to my friends and family in DeBerg. And I also want to say what I love seeing is a representative from Pittsburgh sitting next to the representative from Ohio. Normally, never the twain shall meet, but it's after football season, and it's wonderful to be here and present to. Uh, I, I didn't know you were committee. from Pittsburgh. You can take all the time you like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So. Let me begin by responding to some important points already made. And Mr. Edmonds, who uh, he highlights this problem of cyber crimes per perpetuated against those he serves in Detroit. And this demonstrates the danger of policy focusing solely on price and not other important factors such as security. Now, consider the predicament of the European Union today. To meet regulators' low price requirements, broadband providers had to cost cut so severely that they ended up buying cheap, unsafe Huawei equipment. And this effort to deliver low prices has put Europeans' privacy and security at risk. Now, fortunately, in the U.S., the FCC recently adopted rules restricting subsidies for equipment that's deemed a security risk. Nevertheless, there's at least another $20 billion annually in federal broadband funds, which is not scrutinized for security purposes, not to mention additional grants at the state and local level. Now, it's not only our network equipment that's vulnerable. Our National Vulnerability Database lists such commonplace items, such as Lexmark printers and Lenovo NAT laptops, as products which can compromise the user's security. Now, that information may be listed in some federal database, but it's never communicated to the end retailer or consumer, which itself is a policy failing. Now, security is worth paying for, and it matters to all of us. 
Another casualty of the European policy is network investment. In the last two decades, the level of private network investment in Europe has been cut in half. It was once one-third of the world's total, but today it's 15%. Regulators have removed the incentive to invest, and unsurprisingly, the, the region is two years behind on 5G. Now, thankfully, the U.S. has maintained a high level of private investment, which has generally increased year over year. Americans are less than 5% of the world's population, but they enjoy more than 25% of the world's privately provisioned network resources. It's an amount that's approaching $90 billion annually, almost $2 trillion since 1996. This is a staggering success, and it reflects a bipartisan consensus to focus on facilities-based competition. Now, a myopic focus on low prices is not only misguided, it's also unsafe. Moreover, it does not address complex problems we are talking about today, which require multidisciplinary approaches. However, there's one maxim which can help us. People adopt services, not networks. The demand for broadband is what economists call derived demand. Consumers adopt broadband for the services they get from the networks, not from the networks themselves. This is important because you can't fix with supply solutions what are inherently demand problems. Now, in the testimony today, we're referencing many organizations such as NTIA, Pew, uh, John Horrigan from the Technology Policy Institute, who note that the gaps in broadband adoption can be attributed to age, income, and education. Now, closing these gaps is largely about empowering individuals, not favoring any one firm or technology. Now, the single best thing we can do for internet adoption and inclusion is to support our current growing economy. It continues to deliver increased wages, employment, and opportunity. When people have more money in their pockets, they can buy more of all goods and services, including broadband. Now, I'm thrilled that we're in the midst of a blue-collar boom where wages are rising fastest for the poorest and youngest among us. Moreover, we have a record level of employment for women and people of color. With historic tax cuts and deregulation, thousands of new opportunity zones have sprouted across the country. These empower people to seek new skills, better jobs, and ownership of a home, all of which are factors which increase the likelihood of adopting broadband. Now, I lament that six million households are not online today because of cost, but the good news is that things are changing quickly for the better. And the FCC has taken actions which have increased the availability of broadband and reduced deployment costs. Uh, under this, the fantastic work of Chairman Ajit Pai. These include $1.5 billion to in Connect American funds to 700 rural homes and businesses in 45 states, an additional $5 billion for over 300,000 households, $1 billion to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and my favorite accomplishment of all is cutting $1 billion in cost by ending the reports that the FCC no longer uses. In closing, I encourage the committee to allow the flourishing of the exciting bottom-up solutions we've heard today. And it's important that this committee would also focus on the issues of national importance, notably spectrum and security, which are intertwined with our global race to 5G. And so I remind you to think about um, uh, what needs to be done at the state and local level and not have an urge that every problem needs to be fixed by the federal government. And thank you for the test this time today. Generally, that yields back. It's uh, now my pleasure to recognize Ms. Sohn for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify on two crucial issues, digital equity and broadband adoption. It's indisputable that broadband internet is an essential tool for participation in our society, our economy, and our culture. Many job applications and government services are only available online. 70% of teachers assign homework that must be submitted online. Numerous TV shows and movies are exclusively online. Broadband internet access has fundamentally changed the nature of commerce, education, and health care. It enables unprecedented flexibility for Americans to choose where they live, how they work, and how they care for their families. However, 141 million people in the U.S. don't have fixed home internet at the FCC's outdated 25 down, 3 up broadband definition. That's nearly 43% of Americans. What's more alarming is that home broadband adoption rates aren't increasing. They've remained stable for the past three years. That makes this hearing even more important. The digital divide affects every region of our country, although communities of color and low-income Americans are far more likely not to have broadband. A recent study by the Pew Research Center 
showed 79% of white U.S. adults have home broadband, while the same is true of only 66% of black adults and 61% of Hispanics. The study showed that 92% of Americans making $75,000 or more annually have home broadband, while only 56% making less than $30,000 annually do. The racial component of the digital divide is a byproduct not only of income inequality, but of structural inequality like discriminatory housing and lending practices. This divide persists because of the high cost of broadband and computers in the US. Study after study shows this. Current research suggests that low-income people can only afford to pay about $10 monthly for broadband. Anything more competes with other utility bills and the cost of food. Meeting the goal of universal connectivity and providing fixed broadband about $10 per month requires a multi-pronged strategy, what my Benton colleague Jonathan Salat calls an affordability agenda. It includes one, price transparency. Carriers should be required to submit non-promotional pricing information, including equipment and other fees to the FCC, which should make that information public. The FCC or Congress should also restore the fixed broadband consumer disclosure label. Both will help consumers make informed choices about the price, quality, and value of their broadband service. Two, more competition. More competition means lower broadband prices. Even under the FCC's overly optimistic data, nearly 30% of the country has access to no more than two providers at 25.3 speeds, and 95% has access to no more than two at speeds of 110. If we really want communities to lead, Congress should prohibit states from blocking communities that wish to build their own broadband networks and also give a bidding preference to open access networks when allocating deployment subsidies. These networks allow any broadband provider to provide last mile service. An open access network in Utah gives residents of 15 cities a choice of 10 ISPs. Most Americans can't imagine that. Three, a strong lifeline program. Congress should strengthen lifeline and make it easier for the most vulnerable in society to access the program. It should make clear that Lifeline can support broadband service, restore the broadband provider designation to bring new competition to the program, and give USAC the resources it needs to expedite the hard launch of the National Eligibility Verifier, which will make eligibility determinations automatic for many applicants. Policymakers should also consider providing an additional subsidy so Lifeline recipients can purchase fixed broadband. The $9.25 subsidy doesn't go very far for the broadband needed to do research papers, apply for jobs, and access telehealth services. Four, low-cost broadband for federally subsidized networks. The FCC disperses billions of dollars annually to mobile and fixed providers to build out their networks. It should require those carriers to provide a $10 a month high-speed broadband plan to low-income Americans. Five, support for access to and through community anchor institutions. Some community anchor institutions have adopted programs that extend learning beyond their walls. Libraries have been experimenting with mobile wireless hotspot programs, which allow people to check out broadband hotspots for home use. Schools have been providing buses equipped with Wi-Fi for students to use after hours. Congress or the FCC should clarify that these programs are eligible for E-rate funds. Finally, last but not least, Congress and the FCC should assist local communities' digital inclusion efforts. Local advocates are doing the hard work of educating residents about low-cost broadband options, providing digital literacy and job skills training, and distributing low-cost computers. Congress should pass the Digital Equity Act, which establishes grant programs to support state and local digital equity efforts. These funds will incentivize more states and localities to develop digital inclusion plans and will provide sorely needed funds to the small nonprofits doing the hard work of connecting their communities. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sherrill, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you to Ranking Member Lotta and the subcommittee members for holding this hearing. My name is Jeff Searle. I am director of the Broadband Infrastructure Office at the North Carolina Department of Information Technology. Our office leads state initiatives to ensure all North Carolinians can access affordable, reliable, high-speed internet service. On behalf of Governor Roy Cooper and State Chief Information Officer Eric Boyette, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share North Carolina's approach to ensure all individuals and communities have the capacity and tools needed to fully participate in the 21st century society and economy. The governor has made closing the digital divide one of his top priorities. My oral statement will focus on four key points. One, this is a problem. Two, its root causes have been identified. Three, it is solvable. And four, governments at all levels can and should lead. Policy, better data, grants, subsidies, and partnerships all work. 
In North Carolina, much like the rest of the country, not having the internet in your home makes it harder to see a doctor or nurse without leaving your house, harder to do homework outside of the classroom, harder to start a small business, and in many cases, harder to interact with your state and local government. In North Carolina, we recognized that adoption was a problem several years ago. In 2015, before writing the state's broadband plan, we surveyed 3,500 local leaders. When asked what their concerns were regarding the lack of broadband in their communities, the number one response was the homework gap. We wrote our state plan with equal attention paid to availability and adoption focusing on the homework gap. Our findings are validated by data collected nationally. The FCC estimates that 94.8% of North Carolina's households have access to broadband. Alarmingly, only 59% of those with access are adopting. The most recent report from the American Community Survey puts North Carolina's household adoption rate for all internet speeds at 78%. The survey also found that more than 726,000 North Carolina households do not have access to a meaningful device, meaning a laptop, a desktop, or tablet. Based on our own research, we estimate that between one quarter to half a million students fall into the homework gap. We recognized there was a problem, uh, and so we first uh, worked to identify the root causes. We found that broadband coverage is a key determinant of adoption. Of course, if individuals uh, can only adopt broadband in areas where it's available, but subscription cost is the main barrier to adoption for those with access, followed by digital literacy, access to devices, and relevancy. But why this is a serious problem is still misunderstood or underappreciated. Research shows that sheer availability of or access to broadband isn't enough to positively impact a local economy. Rather, it's the adoption of it. When people have it in their homes and use it in ways that positively impact their economic outlook, we begin to see a positive relationship between broadband and a community's economic health. In North Carolina, we're focused on tackling the barriers to adoption, even as we invest in expansion of broadband infrastructure. In 2017, we formed the Digital Equity and Inclusion Collaborative to gather and learn from nonprofits, universities, and state agencies who are working to close the digital divide. Our office in the State Library of North Carolina won a $250,000 two-year grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to launch a pilot program at local libraries that provides equipment and digital literacy training to families of K through 12 students in need. We also partner with the state librarian and, and nine library systems to make equipment such as Wi-Fi hotspots or computer, computers available to students. In early 2019, our office partnered with the North Carolina Department of Human and Health Services Office of Rural Health to secure a grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission to identify the broadband and telehealth challenges and opportunities in 20 western counties. This partnership also funded an expansion of East Carolina University's successful telepsychiatry program to four rural counties in eastern North Carolina. Our larger municipalities have been leading the effort to close the digital divide for many years. For example, in Durham, a group of volunteers from various nonprofits and city agencies formed Digital Durham to close the homework gap in East Durham. Uh, and of course, in Charlotte, the nationally recognized Charlotte Digital Inclusion Alliance is working aggressively and innovatively to close the region's digital divide. North Carolina also boasts several nonprofits such as Cramden and RTP and E2D in Charlotte, both of whom refurbished used computers and distribute them to those in need, as well as uh, provide digital literacy training. Governments, particularly state governments, can play important leadership roles by pursuing evidence-based policymaking, uh, convening stakeholders, and educating the public. Competition drives affordability and innovation. We should continue to work on policies that incentivize competition. But where market forces are not working, successful evidence-based solutions include grants, subsidies, partnerships between local governments, nonprofits, and internet service providers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about North Carolina's comprehensive approach to closing the digital divide, and I look forward <coughs> to answering any questions. Thank you. So we've now concluded our openings, and we're going to move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. Uh, I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, Mr. Schrell and Mr. Edmonds, uh, when we talk about the challenges that our nation faces in deploying broadband nationally, I think everyone here can acknowledge that there are not sufficient private sector incentives to bring broadband to everyone, and that the federal government has a necessary role to play. But when it comes to digital equity, your respective governments are working to close the digital divide, 
Uh, but do you see those efforts succeeding in the long term if the federal government doesn't play any role in that uh, to help you address that challenge? And what kinds of long-term harms do you see if we continue to let this problem fester? Uh, maybe start with Mr. Sorrell and then Mr. Edmonds, you, you can go next. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great question. And you know, I think the way that we incentivize uh, the internet service providers and incentivize good corporate citizenship is, uh, is about through the purse strings, frankly. I mean, we have federal grant programs that fund deployment, uh, and, and those are, um, and, and we like those, we like money at the state level, uh, but um, if they were tied or uh, conducted in concert with some adoption programs, um, I think that would be the way to, to really drive this issue um, home and make sure that there are uh, digital literacy or other, um, other programs that would be available to those where these deployment dollars are going. For example, in North Carolina, we do have a state rural broadband grant program and um, we have advocated that we tie in a scoring uh, for those applicants, uh, and they can increase their score if they, had, if they um, create some sort of adoption program. And it could be partnering with a nonprofit. Doesn't necessarily mean they have to run it, but something, uh, and I think that's probably the, the, the first thing that we need to do. Thank Mr. You. Edmonds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. And locally, I would say that while we are able to essentially galvanize people around this issue, namely the inter internet service providers and the private sector, one thing that we have to be cognizant of, of really what we're actually partnering on. So while Comcast and a litany of our local internet service providers have really stepped up in a major way, we don't want to get into the, into the position to exhaust their generosity. And I don't think that's actually a sustainable play. When I had mentioned earlier in my uh, testimony that we want to be able to be in the position to further incentivize, if we actually had some funding outside of um, goodwill, I think that we will actually be able to do much more. So I don't believe in the long term what we're doing is uh, sustainable. Um, I think that it's commendable for all the partners at the table. Uh, and I do think that we will have an immediate impact as we already are. However, from a sustainable way, as technology continues to evolve, we need to have something that we can look to from a long-term strategy that's actually going to make sense. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Seifer, uh, you talked about the skills gap for digital literacy in our workforce in your testimony. And for industries like manufacturing and agriculture, tell us what, what are the risks to employees that lack these skills uh, as these industries change? And are older workers missing out on opportunities? How's this dynamic playing out in urban and rural communities? Right, so we know that there, the jobs are out there. We know there are IT jobs, um, or even the jobs that aren't necessarily defined as technical. They're called like middle skill tech jobs where you need to understand how to use um, spreadsheets. You can flip back and forth between applications. Um, you can um, feel confident that if you don't understand one app, it's okay, because you'll figure it out. So that's what we're missing. Um, so those are the, it's a basic digital literacy skills, but it's a continuum of skills. And so in order to help people be ready for those other jobs, which are out there, right? We know the jobs are that. That's one of the things that's so frustrating. We have the jobs, but our folks don't have the skills is that we have to help them where they are because it's intimidating. Thank you. Ms. Sohn, you've said the deployment, or, or some people have said that the deployment of 5G services will reduce the price of broadband and that it will connect rural communities and help close the digital divide in low-income communities. Do you really think those things are going to happen? And if not, why? Yeah, I certainly didn't say that. <laughs> I think it's really important to emphasize that there's so much that's still unknown and untested about 5G. You know, the companies are not sure whether there's even a case for consumers to really benefit or whether this is an enterprise uh, technology that allows for drones and self-driving cars and smart cities. So we, do, we don't know that. What we also don't know is what the price is going to be. You know, Angela Seifer talked about the price of devices, which we do know are going to be expensive. Samsung just introduced a $1,300 5G phone, but we have no idea what the monthly cost is going to be. But what we absolutely do know, and what the executives, what both Verizon and T-Mobile executives have admitted, is that in rural areas, 5G is probably not going to be a whole lot better than 4G. That's about the best they're going to get. Thank you. Uh, I would note to my colleagues that I'm stopped with three seconds left, and I hope that sets an example for the rest of you. <laughs> uh, I will now recognize my good friend, Mr. Ladder. For well, thank you. I, you know, I hope you're not talking to me about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thanks to our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Layton, if I could start uh, my questions with you. This committee has spent much time 
focusing on how to connect all Americans to acceptable broadband speeds. In my district of Northwest, West Central Ohio, we still have areas that are completely unserved. So encouraging broadband deployment in rural America is one of my top priorities. In your testimony, you mentioned that regulatory discrimination costs our economy about 30 to 40 billion annually, money that could otherwise be spent on deploying broadband to our rural areas. Will you expand on this particularly about how money alone won't solve this issue and what actions should Congress be taking? So thank you for that question. Uh, I'd like to follow up quickly on the 5G uh, issue as it relates to rural areas. Uh, what we can see with 5G now, that's, which is in cities, is it's largely what's called broadband substitution. People are cutting the cord, they cancel their cable subscription, and are getting their uh, broadband connection now through wireless. So uh, this is going on in cities today, and when we look at rural areas, one of the fastest ways that we can bring high-speed broadband to the rural area is through uh, the mid-band spectrum. And there's a, a, an issue in front of the FCC right now on the C-band auction, which would be the fastest way to bring high-speed broadband to rural areas. Um, with regard to this issue of regulatory discrimination, um, as an economist, what I like to encourage policymakers is to think about uh, broadband as a multi-sided market and ensuring that all of the participants are able to um, be involved in the broadband market. So historically, we've had a policy which would minimize the participation of the large content providers. So for example, a Netflix, which accounts for a large share of the traffic, they're not participating in the last mile uh, um, in, uh, infrastructure cost. So that's quite significant because that means the cost has to be recovered in another way. So it falls on the end consumer. And part of the challenge today is, you know, when we talked about if it's too high, well, we're forcing end consumers to pay too much when large content providers are not participating. So in a, in a free market, you would have more participation of the largest content providers, and that would help uh, defray some of the cost for the poorest users. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharal, if I could uh, ask you the next question here. I also found your, your testimony when you're talking about the, the adoption problem out there that you said that uh, you know, it's two sides of a coin, the access side and then the adoption side. And then also about you know, the pros and cons out there about why we really have to be out there talking about broadband and getting it there. On the pro side, you're talking about those who, uh, who adopt the broadband are more likely to find jobs learn new skills, successfully navigate social services, and those who do not, and those who do not adopt. And then on the con side, the low adoption results in loss of opportunity, educational, economic income, civic, and cultural. And then when you summed up your uh, testimony at the very end, you also, I thought it was interesting you had said that you know, competition drives that affordability and innovation. And so looking at uh, your, your state and what you've done on leveraging existing resources and creating partnership, how does North Carolina State uh, Broadband Office connect with communities that need internet access? Well, we, um, we have a technical assistance team. So I have four, four members in our office that actually uh, live in the areas where they work and uh, they work closely with local leaders to develop um, planning all, in all sorts of uh, aspects of broadband on the deployment side and on the adoption side. And we've, our office has really just started to tackle this adoption issue. Um, we rely a lot on, on the research that's done nationally and the studies that have, that have been uh, published nationally. Uh, we did our own study, however, a few years ago uh, called NC Light Up that's on our website. Um, and we did a control study with 179 families. Um, after, at the end, and the conclusions from, of, of that study showed that even three months afterwards, uh, the families that were receiving a subsidy for the service, 89% um, uh, of them kept the internet service. And so we're still looking and diving into, in, into the benefits uh, uh, for those, those types of families, um, but, we, um, but, but our re outreach is mostly um, with the local levels through either our technical assistance team or our homework gap um, report that we published. Yeah, in my last 25 seconds now, do you do also have workshops then for folks out there? <clears throat> we just completed uh, a round of workshops we called Broadband 101, and we went to uh, all areas of the state, and uh, we had our councils of governments uh, coordinate the local leaders, and we taught uh, about uh, what they can do to enhance uh, deployment and uh, some adoption uh, issues. And we have a collaborative, too. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm ending on three seconds, too, so I yield back. <laughs> Good job. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. I thank the chair. Mr. Sorrell, do you believe more people should wear bow ties? 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate your, your testimony concerning adoption as well as deployment. I think that's a key issue along with the cost of equipment. And that's been raised several times. Is there any more you want to add to that, the adoption issue? On, on, on the issue of whether we competition in, uh, helps? Well, or? whether deployment should precede adoption. Uh, I, I think that they can be done in concert. I mean, in our state, at least, we've been doing a lot on the deployment side of things. Um, we even have, for example, in one county, they receive BTOP money. They have 90% of the households connected to fiber, but only 59% uh, a script subscription rate. So obviously there's something there, and it depends. We, we're finding county by county it's different. Well, thank you. Uh, in your written testimony, you discussed the economic impact of of uh, gaps in the broadband adoption and digital literacy. Can you expand on that and discuss the economic impacts that you've seen on the ground? So uh, we have seen um, primarily, uh, especially in our rural communities, um, more entrepreneurship. Um, for example, the city of Wilson um, has, has done a lot and it's allowed them to say, hey, we're a connected city. They've attracted uh, some smaller companies. So what we're seeing is, on the individual level, uh, particularly, uh, an opportunity for income enhancement. And then we have some small businesses uh, that are really starting to, uh, to connect. I, uh, there's a woman in, um, in Southern Beaufort County who uh, runs a agro-tourism business. 75% of her marketing and ticket sales are over the internet. So when the internet's down, she, you know, she struggles, but uh, it gives her an opportunity uh, to run a business in a very, very rural area of North Carolina. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Seifer, uh, would you like to comment about the returns we're likely to see from targeted federal investment in broadband adoption and digital literacy? So the returns we're going to see are um, in, in every industry and in every aspect of our lives. Because I think one can think about how you use the Internet, and that impacts then everything you do, right? So education, health, uh, work, uh, it, it is it is in everything, so the impacts are going to just be astounding if we had everybody participating. And I think it's also important for us to think about how that the internet is more valuable because so many people are on it, right? So that thing that you're using is more valuable if there's more people there. So if we have more of our low-income citizens participating and the disabled and the seniors and the youth, then what does that do to how the rest of us then interact online. Yeah, well, in my district, there's about 64,000 individuals employed in the uh, construction, transportation, uh, and storage workers. Um, why would federal investments in digital training help that group? Or how would it help that group? It gives them more opportunities for jobs, right? Because then they're not limited to that field. Yes, if they'd like to stay there, awesome. But their possibilities for advancement go up when they have more digital skills. Yes, Ms. So. Can I just add thank you for the opportunity? Is that a, a lot of skills that we, you know, consider to be sort of, you know, uh, technical skills or sort of more mid-level skills, service skills, require require internet skills. So, for example, uh, when I take my car to Midas in Bethesda, they're constantly complaining because they can't get enough people to work as auto workers to repair cars, and those folks need digital skills. Yeah. Okay, it's not just a matter of, you know, fixing the engine anymore. You have to be able to use computers. Thank you. Um, Mr. Edmonds, um, why do you think that the model of public partner, private partnerships is, is unsustainable in Detroit? I, I, don't, I don't think it's sustainable because I think we might be motivated by different things. Um, you know, when the public, public sector, we obviously uh, aren't necessarily looking every single time at our... Uh, residents as commodities, if you will. And I'm not saying that that's what the private sector is doing, but what I am saying is we have different responsibilities. And so when I'm talking to my, my residents and wanting to get them online, um, I'm not necessarily doing that about in a profit-driven way. I'm looking at this because these residents uh, essentially matter to the future of our, our city and ultimately our country. And when we're engaging with the private sector, it might be they have, a, they have different objectives. We might fall in line under, you know, um, Maybe someone wants to essentially highlight a, a partnership model that might be deemed innovative, but I'm not really looking for innovation. I'm looking for what's effective. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask for another five minutes. <laughs> I have great affection for the gentleman, but that request is denied. 
chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for being here. It's a it's a great debate. We have been struggling with um, broadband deployment, especially in the areas that have been mentioned for years. Um, I, I think we're making a lot of success in the broadband portion um, through a couple different agencies. We've got the USDA Rural Development Program, which has been I mean, I just got an announcement this morning of coming to Hamilton County to help roll out more. Um, we have the FCC in the last cycle with legislation to help. Um, the state of Illinois has gone on board now to talk about connecting. So all that is, uh, that's, you know, the, the, so this is kind of a national, ex a natural extension to, okay, if you connect, will they come or are they trained to come or do they have the, the, the uh, connectivity. We do accept the premise that some people who get fiber run to their house will not want to be online, do we? I mean, I'm from rural America, and I'm just here to tell you there are some people who don't want to be on the World Wide Web. They don't want to be connected. They, they're worried about their privacy. They're worried about all this other stuff. So it's kind of like in the economist's point of view, 3.5% unemployment is de facto full employment. Uh, if you've taken, taken economics and because there are people tr always in transition. Um, so we're never going to get 100% and we're not going to get 100% full deployment. But I was, I was interested in this debate about with all these grant programs that we have, maybe, and I think if Mr. Sorrell, you, you mentioned it, why not in the application process kind of make a determination of, well, tell us what you've done in the past to help this, this portion or tell us what your plan is to help educate and connect people as part of these application processes. That way you have another variable by which the decisions, decision makers can use to see how effective it was. Uh, when we did the stimulus bill years ago, one of the problems was it gave money, but it just overlaid pipes without a business model. So this is kind of the other flip side. This is giving money without really a business plan for connecting or educating. And Mr. Earl, well, back to you too. I, was, I wrote down, you're doing Broadband 101. We, we could probably use that class, even though we've been on the committee for a long time. Happy uh, to, happy yeah, to. Yeah, uh, because it is curious. And I'm gonna go to a, a little, I, Ms. Son, I saw you roll your eyes. I love watching people's faces uh, during testimony. And so I'm, a recent, recent, I'm getting ready to retire. This is my last year here. And as a member of Congress, I've been able to survive on my iPhone and my iPad without a laptop. So now I gotta go to the real world, and I'm thinking, well, that might not be enough, you know, if I have to start doing spreadsheets and then connecting. I might need, actually need to figure out how to turn a laptop on and, and do stuff. Um, but that brings up this 4G, 5G debate, and whether 5G does actually represent some competition um, Dr. Layton says, uh, yes, you rolled your eyes saying, oh, I don't think so. So uh, why the eye roll? So my concern is that we don't make policy prematurely, okay? 5G is a marathon and not a sprint. I know there's a lot of talk about the race to 5G, but if you even ask the companies themselves, they will say we're not 100% sure what the business model is for this. So that is my concern. I'm not anti-5G, 5G is coming, but it's, I think it would be unwise to make policy, broadband adoption and equity policy based on what 5G might be. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and so I wanna give Dr. Layton a chance, but I, I do know that, if, and I caveated the question with, I mean, I'm not on my laptop, right? I'm on email, texting, uh, searching the web to get information. So I'm not full bore into the issue, but I do know that sometimes I have bad Wi-Fi connection or slow Wi-Fi connection and I'll go to 4G and, and get it and I'll turn off my Wi-Fi signal. So uh, Dr. Layton, Mike. Well, this whole hearing was worth it for me today to hear Gigi say she doesn't want to make policy prematurely. <laughs> I think that's great. Uh, so <clears throat> I think to your whole point here, this is the whole point of view of why it's great that people have, should have more money in their own pockets. 
why we should allow enterprises to keep more of their own profits, because every community has different needs. And the more that you have your own resources, you can decide how you want to spend it. You can decide how you want to invest it. So uh, when you talk about, as you opened your question on the big question of the federal funding, there's money sp sprinkled across the whole place. If we looked at the whole thing, we could probably do it a lot more efficiently and a lot more effectively by the different agencies, USTA, Department of Transportation, FCC, working together in a more cooperative way. Thank you. Time has expired. The chair now recognizes Mr. Loebsack for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Doyle and Ranking Member Ladd for convening this hearing today, and I thank all of our witnesses uh, for their attendance as well. Uh, I do appreciate that we're having this hearing today. I've worked throughout my time on this committee to advance internet adoption and connect to Iowa communities. I also have a rural district, as you might imagine, uh, in southeast Iowa. I partner with uh, my friend uh, Bob Latta, and uh, we got this uh, uh, very, very bipartisan bill through the Broadband Data Act uh, last year, and it passed the committee uh, pretty, pretty overwhelmingly, as you know. But clearly, there still are many challenges to ensure that all Americans are able to access and use the Internet, uh, because in today's economy, as already, has been, as already has been mentioned, if you don't have reliable Internet access, you're probably going to be shut out of the digital economy. Uh, whether your child's trying to do uh, his or her homework, or you're searching for a job, or accessing telemedicine, trying to operate a small business, it's truly never been more important. I think we can all agree on that, uh, to be able to connect to the Internet and the outside world. I just have a couple of quick questions. Both these are for Ms. Seifert and Ms. Sohn. Um, the FCC doesn't currently collect data about the cost of broadband service. The Broadband Data Act included some quality of service metrics to be collected, but I'd like to ask you how you think the collection of additional quality of service metrics like price data uh, would impact, if at all, uh, access to broadband. Let's start with Ms. Seifert this time. Having data on the cost of home broadband would draw attention and be able to create solutions specifically around those geographic areas that don't have affordable broadband. Right now, if you try to go figure out how much broadband costs in any area, it takes actually quite a bit of research. It seems crazy. It seems like we could just look it up on the internet, but you can't just look right. it up on the internet. What you'll find are um, the introductory rates. You won't find what it actually costs. And so solutions that can then be created for particular neighborhoods, for particular regions, for particular counties that are struggling with the cost in that area. I'm going to get to that my second question, too. Uh, yeah, Ms. Sohn. So we've actually seen in the E-rate context, uh, the group Education Superhighway did a study that showed that once the FCC required price transparency, prices for building networks to schools and libraries went down. So it, it would cause competitive pressure, plus consumers should know what they're paying for when they buy broadband. And if they do, if they're lucky enough to have competitive choices, they can compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. And so my second question um, has to do with an article that was in the Wall Street Journal in December. It found that, quote, Americans in low-income neighborhoods and rural areas get slower broadband speeds, even though they generally pay similarly, similar monthly prices as their counterparts in wealthy and urban areas. And to both of you, uh, again, the question is, do you think that rural and low-income areas are receiving a different quality of service as a result of technical challenges, or do you think there are other factors at play? And let's start with you this time, Ms. Sohn. Well, look, those are not attractive communities to serve. So you get one provider, there's no competitive pressure, they get higher prices. I mean, you know, basically, if you're low-income or middle-class or live in a community of color, you get screwed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the other important point to always keep in mind is that in the, in the U.S., Internet service is a commodity, right? You're going to get the highest price for it that you, as you can, and none of us should be surprised. We're like, yes, of course, this is a free market. But if that result is that we don't have enough competition and then we end up with particular individuals and families who can't afford it because the only option is an expensive option, then we, we as a society have to say that's not okay. And I might add that this actually happens not just in rural areas versus urban areas, but uh, even in, in Iowa City where I live. Uh, if you're in a new subdivision, for example, um, you have limited options because not everybody wants to go into that subdivision until there are enough homes actually created. And, that, and that's actually a you know, fairly wealthy area, too. Yeah. That raises another question, if you don't mind, and that's, that's the problem of exclusives in, in multi-tenant environments or condominium environments. 
where a cable operator or a telco will basically have an exclusive. And you're at the mercy That's of right. those providers. And I know the FCC is looking at this, but they can't get rid, they can't ban those exclusives fast enough for me. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I was going to yield the rest of my time to Mr. McNerney, but there's not enough time for a question and answer. But thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. Uh, chair now recognizes my buddy, Mr. Olson. Five minutes, not a second more. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the chair and welcome to our five witnesses. Mr. Sorrell, I have to start out with an apology. My wife is a Duke Blue Devil. <laughs> and that means that I have to inform you that on February 8th of this year, her devils will go down to your Dean Dome and put a whooping on your Tar Heels to be repeated <laughs> next month on March 7th at Duke Cameron Stadium. Sorry. <laughs> Just the way it is. Willing to wager barbecue. <laughs> That's why I'm in my 27th year of marriage and my sixth term in Congress. Texas 22 is a booming suburb of Houston, Texas. We're the most diverse county in America, ethnically. We have the richest population per capita of 254 counties in Texas. That means you would think we are preparing for 5G and looking forward to 10G in the future. Access to internet is for everybody in Fort Bend County. If you thought that, you'd be wrong. This past Thursday, I was out in Needville, Texas. Needville is all about cotton, milo, livestock, and Needville High School Blue Jays. I went by to see the Chamber of Commerce's small business awardee a place that's called All We Need Farm. It's run by a woman, small business, named Stacy Russell. She makes ice cream popsicles with goat milk from Nubian and Angora goats. She quit her job as a CPA in 2000 to pursue her dream of making these popsicles. She bought her first herd eight years later in 2008. She and her husband were so good, in 2017, they won the American Dairy Goat Association, Goat Association product competition. The best goat milk popsicles in the entire country came from Neville, Texas. Stacy's problem is she has no real access to the internet. On her street, her neighbors were there a long time before she was, they have cable access to internet. She has none of that cable. She can't convince somebody to come out and put that cable down. Satellites are too expensive and maybe there's a problem with latency issues. So my question, Dr. Layton, is how can Stacy break through and have internet access so she can thrive and grow her business? Any thoughts, ideas, barricades, DC? This is in her location where, where she's in this part of... Um... Yes, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah on a rural road there, again, the neighbors had, because they were there like 10 years, 20 years before her. They got cables laid, she can't get somebody to help her out. Again, satellites are too expensive for her right now. Mm -hmm. She has to grow her business, she can't do that until she gets that access. Right, well, I, I'm not familiar with the, the requirements for deployment in this particular part of Texas. I'd have to look into it. What, um, what I am encouraged to see is that, for example, I'm very excited about the new high-throughput satellites, which are 100 megabit per second. They are online to come uh, online, I think, in less than a year. Um, the, the FCC has um, approved over a dozen new satellite programs, low Earth orbit. These should not be laughed at. They're very serious. They're being used around the world. I think that's a big deal. Um, I would just come back to what regulatory barriers are there. I mean, and, and hats off to this woman for pursuing her dream. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Salton, you want to add to that? Yes. This would be the perfect place for communities to build their own broadband. And unfortunately, in Texas, uh, is one of 19 states that prohibits their local communities from building broadband. Uh, I have cousins who live in Dallas. I often visit Austin. And I get similar complaints about the lack of broadband in places where you think it would be. And that's why community builds are so critically important and why Congress should prohibit those kind of 
uh, prohibit states from stopping communities from deciding whether or not to serve people like your friend. Sorrell? In small business adoption and uh, programs and also grants to small businesses, we had a program in North Carolina that allowed some manufacturing facilities to hook up to fiber, provided a grant, and, uh, and they've expanded their operations and communicate with um, customers in China. So we need that too. Final question for you, Dr. Layton. This is on NFL neutrality. January 6th of 1980, Houston Oilers Mike Renfro scored a touchdown in three rivers State, and that was denied. <laughs> Would you break from Chairman Doyle and admit the rest blew the call? <laughs> on, on this line, I'm forever a, a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so I'm sorry. I'm not going to come over to that side on that question. It was a touchdown. I yield back. <laughs> I thank the gentleman. I, I'd just like to say, Mr. Sorrell, it was mighty kind of you uh, not to mention the Houston Astros in retaliation for his uh, Duke statements. But the uh, gentleman's time has expired. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. B.C., five uh, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me for a magic five minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Olson, thank you. Uh, Roger Williams and I appreciate you mentioning Mike Renfro, who's a fellow Arlington Heights High School graduate out of Fort Worth, Texas. So thank you very much. Um, Touchdown! <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. Every time I see Mike out and about in Fort Worth, we joke around about that, about how it definitely was a touchdown. Um, uh, Mr. Edwards, in your testimony, you discussed the difference between the availability, the availability of broadband and usage. Uh, you set out uh, in a table in your testimony displaying in the district that I represent there is 100% availability, availability of broadband, which according to your table is higher than 27 of my fellow subcommittee members, but usage is 35%, uh, which is 20th out of 31 members. Can you explain how availability is so high, but usage is so low? So really what, and um, to uh, explain the context of that data as well. So that data was uh, gathered by Microsoft, um, where they actually began looking at the software updates. So anyone who was having a software update by way of Microsoft, they were able to determine the speed. So it wasn't a survey, it was actually automatically pulling that data. The one thing that um, they did not include in that data piece was uh, mobile broadband. So anyone who was doing updates over cellular networks. Now the good thing is we have the data by way of the American Community Survey where we can, ref where we can reference that, but the disparity is still going to be uh, pronounced. And so when we begin looking at the availability and the usage, um, like uh, to summarize a sentiment that you know, some other people have already covered today, just because you build a network doesn't mean people will come. And so when you begin looking at uh, the availability, we can have that all day, but however, if we don't have the uh, necessary means to get people online and to keep them online, um, I think that's what we're seeing that. And so, for example, in the city of Detroit, if we were to look at poverty rates, and Detroit has obviously a pronounced poverty rate, we are seeing the role that cost plays in people having perpetual, meaningful broadband adoption. You having it for one month is fine. But again, for a year, a day in and day out cost, someone can afford that monthly. That's something where we're still struggling to get, especially when we begin looking at uh, broadband packages in America. Now, um, cost being a big barrier, but again, we don't really have the, the necessary digital skills training as well. Um, you know, one thing that um, I'm gonna echo uh, Angela's uh, sentiment, where she expresses that people aren't willing to pay for things that they might not necessarily fully grasp. And so when we don't have any funding for digital literacy training, I don't see ways that we can essentially insulate people and put them into a pipeline of meaningful broadband adoption as well. So there's really an amalgamation of issues that are keeping people from, from getting online. But again, there's not really any funding for us to address this. Yeah, that's really interesting, which brings me to my next question that I wanted to ask you. Have you, have you had a chance to look very closely at texting and calling versus actual internet usage in urban areas, and the reason why I say that is like if you were to drive through certain areas in my district, uh, you you know most of ma most major retail concepts, new retail concepts will will skip over lower income areas like some of the places that I represent in Fort Worth and Dallas. Uh, but the one new store that you will always see if you could drive through the community uh, outside of a fast food place will be a cell phone place. The cell phone companies are are well represented in these areas because they see them as, as opportunities for big business. Um, do you think that it makes sense to start looking at 
uh, whether it's unlimited data plans or what have you, as a more viable way for communities to be connected, to be able to do things like homework uh, and, and what have you, um, if, if it can be offered at a more of affordable price? You know, I, I always caution people about the tales of smartphones. You know, uh, when I tell people that if, you know, children just having smartphones, they're missing out on the ability to type. Typing is a workforce skill. And so I see the value in cell phones, and I really do. I think that's something that's great to be able to, to uh, communicate. Uh, it's great for emergency response. But at the end of the day, uh, we don't want to stymie our workforce by going with a solution that I think is, um, in, in many cases, misguided. Uh, when we begin also looking at uh, cell phones, while yes, there are a lot of cell phone stores, we also have the data that nearly 40% of Detroit residents uh, are actually struggling with uh, affording a perpetual data plan cost. And so while people might procure a cell phone device, uh, it's useful, uh, Wi-Fi is where they're essentially going. So applications uh, that allow people to be able to send texts or send messages over Wi-Fi are becoming much more popular so someone can procure a device, but at the end of the day, those Wi-Fi networks, so that's where the real value is. So to see people get those devices at those cell phone stores, but then they'll go to where they find those free Wi-Fi locations such as McDonald's or a library. All right, thank you. I have a lot more to ask you, but my magic five minutes have <laughs> elapsed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Long for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, if I start asking health care questions, you'll know that I'm in the wrong committee because we've got two committees going on here today, running back and forth between them. But uh, <clears throat> Dr. Layton, in your testimony, you talk about consumer choice and how a flexible market can allow consumers to adopt the services they need. While America may have slightly higher broadband prices than other countries, what has this approach done for the quality of networks that we do have? So I think the, the main reason is that we have a higher quality. I mean, we, are, um, we have many ways we're leading in a lot of network technologies of all kinds, wireless and wireline. And part of that relates to the investment incentives and the ability to have broadband at different prices. That's an important thing if you want next generation networks. Okay, thank you. And do you, uh, again for you, Dr. Layton, do voluntary efforts to promote broadband, broadband adoption strike the right balance between preventing overregulation and bridging the affordability gap? So I personally would like to see more flexibility in the marketplace. I think that hitherto we have, uh, the regulators have defined the parameters. We haven't focused enough on security and that's very important to consumers. Um, the regulators have overfocused on speed. I think it, the point was made today that um, you know you may your house may have a big, be passed by a gigabit network, but you don't use the full speed on that network. That was the Wall Street Journal article that was referenced before, because depending on the application, you may not need the fastest speed. So there are different applications, different needs, and different prices. So that's why one single price doesn't reflect; it doesn't address the actual needs in the marketplace. Okay, and do they also help promote broadband deployment? Absolutely, because um, when, a, uh, um, when an, uh, an operator is thinking about deploying, they are going to try to serve different needs. There may be enterprise needs, there's individual needs, families, um, uh, single persons. They're not all going to have the same needs, and they have to have different price points to meet those different needs. They need different packages. And so, so that part is why the flexibility needs to be there. Uh, we have overly relied on the FCC defining what the features should be, but that limits the ability of the consumers to define what's important for them. Okay, thank you. And I was an auctioneer for 30 years before I came to Congress, so I talk faster than most people, so I'm going to yield back two and a half minutes of my five. <laughs> well done, Mr. Long. Chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle and Ranking Member Latta. Uh, I'm proud of our recent work to secure funds for broadband development and ensuring the CF FCC's maps are accurate. The digital divide is more than just accurate maps and laying fiber in the ground. It's about access, affordability, uh, Americans feeling empowered online with computer skills, and in my district, and in rural America, I believe that the uh, competition of speeds uh, in rural areas to, to be able to compete with the rest of the nation and the rest of the world uh, should not be at the FCC's minimum. We shouldn't just be happy with getting some internet to people. It has to be competitive internet to people. 
According to a recent Pew Research survey, 10% of U.S. Uh, adults do not use the Internet. The survey found that the majority of these adults were either seniors, 27%. I have a very large population of seniors in the district. Had less than a high school education, 29%. I believe that uh, higher speeds would help with that. Um, being able to have uh, people stay in high school and get a better education in rural areas. And were low income earners $30,000 $30, or less, 18% and lived in rural areas, 22%. And I also happen to have uh, the largest Native American population in the lower 48 states. Closing the digital divide is a complex problem that impacts many constituents in my district. I look forward to finding bipartisan solutions to address these problems. Uh, the Arizona Students Recycling Used Technology Program is a great example of increasing access to internet capability devices. Industry partners donate used hardware to local universities for students to refurbish their laptops and computers. Local libraries will then pair these, this equipment up with Wi-Fi hotspots to help connect their communities. Hopefully we can stop them having to go to McDonald's to do that in the parking lot. One testimonial from the Page Public Library describes this program as a fantastic service for the community and help many complete, complete online job applications. Mr. Edmonds, uh, you discussed the importance of public-private partnerships in the community to increase broadband access. Uh, can FCC or NTIA programs do more with states to develop similar inclusion programs? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, I, I Give me your all, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I believe all of us can, can do more. And one thing that I always want to, um, uh, I guess, keep at the forefront, the value of local leadership, but also uh, recognizing how diverse we, we are as America. So, you know, within your respective uh, district, you have uh, different cities that maybe some of the solutions that I would propose in Detroit would be different. Uh, and you know that that's okay, but at the end of the day, we, we see that there is a you know the private sector has a role, the public sector has a role, federal government has a role. We all have different roles here, and I think that what we're seeing locally is that you know we're we're in our capacity doing the best that we can, but we really aren't getting that leadership oversight that we need to say that it, it would essentially legitimize our cause more than what we're already doing. So what can we do? Well, I would say at the at the onset, one um, I think that it's great to recognizing this issue. Whenever we look at the uh, digital inclusion uh, three-legged stool, advocacy and awareness is oftentimes left out of that equation. And so just being uh, great advocates for one, but two, um, even making um, like digital, digital readiness recommendations and kind of attaching funding to that. Uh, I think that that's where we're a little anemic on. Again, we could come to the, if we were able to come to the table and essentially go to the private sector and say, hey, this is, these are the resources that are made available to us, what would you be interested in supporting as well? That doesn't happen at this point. Okay. Right now, we're just going uh, to them directly and saying, hey, glad that you're here. Uh, we don't have any money, but this is our <laughs> issue. And so if there is any type of funding that was attached to this, we could actually do some real damage here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Seifer, uh, Arizona has a plan and broadband office focused on digital inclusion efforts statewide. However, some states still do not have this type of plan. Could you discuss the importance of every state appointing a trusted official or program to support broadband expansion and digital literacy in 10 seconds? In 10 seconds. <laughs> so most states don't have a plan. Everything that Jeff has described to you today, everyone should know that that is not the norm. Jeff gets asked to speak, his staff gets get asked to speak because they are leading, they are leading it all. Right? And yes, Arizona has, they have a staff member at the State Library whose title includes the term digital inclusion. So Thank you. And I runs around sure. the country, runs around the Arizona helping folks. We should have that everywhere. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair now recognizes Ms. Brooks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, this hearing is incredibly timely. I just recently, when we were in the district last week, um, visited a number of communities because we had a mayor's election in November. Of, um, and so I have a number of new mayors in small communities. 
um, and visited both large cities like the city of Indianapolis that I represent up to smaller communities, uh, little communities like uh, Gas City, Hartford City, very small, under 5,000 people. And um, actually the issue of uh, availability of broadband and availability of connection to the internet is something that is critically important to every community regardless of its size because it will determine and I want to thank each of you for your testimony it was all very very helpful to learn um, and I hope that the mayors that I have recently visited with you know have learned uh, that we do have you know positions like yours Mr. Edmonds in Detroit positions like yours Mr. Searle in North Carolina um, because I do think the leadership and while Indiana is investing in, uh, our Governor Holcomb is investing $100 million in next level broadband to try to help communities, uh, some of these new mayors weren't aware of that and weren't aware that our state legislature has decided to invest in trying to make it available. But I think um, one, I, we called, one of my staffers called um, uh, a small telecom to talk about a small internet provider and uh, to get to the second, uh, he actually said, and this is something we've all heard, you can offer the horse all the water you want, but if he ain't thirsty, so he's not gonna drink it. Uh, I happen to ride and I know what he's talking about. Um, and so the challenge that we do have as a country is trying to educate in many ways um, people, I think particularly, senior citizens more so than the younger people. They're growing up with it. It is uh, something they are so accustomed to, but I wanna you know, spend a little bit more time on how can we focus on including the seniors. I went into one of the mayor's offices and there was a senior citizen sitting at a public access computer outside of his office, and I thought that was great. I have been to my public libraries and have seen a number of people going. Um, but yet, I was also at our state's community college system when people were getting laid off from their jobs. We were teaching them during the recession what a mouse was and how to use a computer. And I think people don't appreciate that that divide still exists in our country. So I wanna focus with my limited time left, how can we educate and do a better job of educating people? I really think it is more of an age issue than we all want to admit. Uh, our young kids, um, it's second nature to them, more so than maybe it is using a pencil or a pen. Um, and so how can we reach, what would be your one idea to help us, and I wanna do kind of a lightning round. What would be your idea, and sorry we're gonna to get to you last, Mr. Searle, but I wanna get everyone's quick idea of how do we expand the literacy. So the digital inclusion programs that are out there now are on the ground, created locally. They know what works, right? They work in with those senior centers, they work with seniors, and they know that it's whatever matters to that senior. What matters to that senior? Is it talking to their kids via Facebook? Right. That's, that's, that's when my mother that's got on Facebook. Right. right. And to Dr. Layton's point, it was what is the serv it's what is the service they're trying to um, access, not the network. Right. Well, in the state of Indiana, and I want to applaud you because you have been, uh, Indiana's been really amazing around uh, uh, the supply side of things, making the way for the 5G networks and so on and understanding all of that. But you could also look at the state government digitizing the state services in some respects that the, the government itself becoming more efficient can provide a pull to the industries and consumers that they have to just become digital as a result. I agree. That has, that has one, Thank one you. side of it. Mr. Edmonds? So I actually uh, engage uh, seniors semi-regularly and we actually had a, a group of uh, seniors where their library closed in their community and uh, they found my phone number and called me and said, hey, you know, our library closed, what, what can we do to connect? Uh, you know, we, we, we can't compete with the other kids who are just there all day, they, they, they take all this stuff, but what can we do? And I think, so place-based place, place -based recommendations are gonna be huge here. Okay. Finding a place where seniors really feel comfortable. Thank you, thanks. Wanna keep Mr. Searle? So my father's 78, he does not consider himself a senior citizen, but he takes computer classes at the public library. So community anchor institutions are key. That's excellent, Ms. Yeah, community anchor institutions are, are excellent and pass the Digital Equity Act, so the folks that uh, Angela represents have the resources to educate everybody, including seniors. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you all for your work. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Clark for five minutes. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member, Ladd. I thank our panelists for lending their expertise 
uh, to us today. The American people deserve access to broadband devices and the internet. They deserve affordable services, and they deserve today's hearing. Congressman McNerney Lujan and I recently introduced H.R. 4486, the Digital Equity Act, to ensure every person is provided access to, the digital, to digital literacy they deserve in 2020 and beyond. Information is power, and someone's income level or zip code should have zero impact on their access to broadband internet. They should not have to depend on smartphones as their only means to participate in today's economy. And so I thank you once again for being here to address the critical issue of the digital divide. I wanted to start with the issue of the census because uh, we've talked about um, access and everything else, and I see everyone nodding. Um, being a member of the Congressional Black Caucus's 2020 Census Task Force, I believe that every person should be counted. I also represent a historically hard to count district. Let me start with you, Ms. Seifer. In your testimony, you discussed the U.S. Census Bureau's online data collection and digital inequity across the United States. Can you please expand on your suggestion that the federal government should do uh, should boost broadband adoption to ensure an accurate count? Right. So we know that the census is going to be um, conducting it online. We know that they're going to be encouraging folks to fill it out online. And so how does that actually play out? It means that libraries are going to end up places that folks go. It means that those who don't have digital skills might just decide not to fill it out at all. Right? That the, there's lots of ways that the community itself can respond, but if they don't have the resources to respond, then those individuals just won't, they won't get counted. Yeah, and uh, I would like to follow up with that a bit and just uh, kind of how I've been summarizing it and telling to people, well, if you don't essentially have the internet, then essentially you don't count. And if you don't count, then you don't matter. And we don't want to obviously send that message, and it's a really, really bleak and hard-hitting message, but that's what needs to be said. And so when even locally on the ground, we are looking to galvanize every resource pop possible. Uh, it's working with uh, wrappers, uh, just as much as we're working with our local grocery stores, actually putting in kiosks uh, any and everywhere. But one thing that it's a bit bleak as well, but uh, maybe morbid optimism, America has two options with the census. Either you prioritize digital equity at the onset and you do a good job in the census, or you don't. And then you're, you're penalized for it, so therefore you would have to prioritize digital equity moving forward. Okay. Did you want to respond, Dr. Layton? Okay. Ms. Ms. Sean? Yeah, I, I would just say, look, uh, the reason that racial minorities are already way behind uh, in broadband adoption is because of, of structural discrimination because of discriminatory lending practices and housing practices. We don't want to exacerbate that by having them not be counted. Mr. Sorrell. So a lot of scrutiny has been applied to the FCC's data collection and their mapping, um, but one of the things that's overlooked is that they rely on the 2010 census numbers mm. to determine the number of households that are either served or unserved in a census block. So having accurate census numbers are key determining where that funding from the FCC will go. So we may be creating, even, digging an even deeper hole in terms of mapping if those who don't have access right now are unable to participate in the 2020 census. Correct. Very well. I, my, my final question is to you, Mr. Edwards. A lot of the conversation about bridging the, the digital divide is focused on rural areas. But I'm curious about how this conversation plays out in um, low-income urban areas. Can you share more information about how many people in Detroit lack access to broadband and how, and share why they are unconnected? Sure, so over 40% of our residents don't have broadband. 27% uh, of our residents don't have broadband of any kind, and approximately 20% of our residents are only cell phone-only households. And really you're seeing just, people are essentially getting in where they fit in. And uh, when you're looking at why people essentially aren't adopting, uh, you know, cost is obviously the biggest barrier. Again, I'm going to keep going back to how perpetual billing really disenfranchises people. Uh, across America, from 2012 to 2017, approximately 1,600 banks closed in rural and urban areas. Oftentimes, those areas were low income. Uh, the residents had less years of, of education, and they were predominantly African American. 
And when we began looking at the, uh, the role that banking institutions have played and for them to be going to online banking, what role does that have to play with financial literacy? And what role does that have to play pairing it with digital literacy training? I think that when we began unpacking these issues and looking at it from a very, very nuanced perspective, we're seeing, again, there's so many factors that are keeping people online and they're essentially tied to other industries where we might not necessarily have the focus on it at the moment. General Lady's time has expired. You, Chair recognizes Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, uh, my colleague, Ms. Brooks, wanted me to make sure that we do understand that a census can be done on paper, too. I don't want, don't want to forget that. We want to use it all sorts of ways um, as best as possible. And I, thank, I thank the uh, panel for being here. And I think it's an outstanding panel because of Go Blue involvement. Mr. Edmonds, uh, Mr. Edmonds, you are a, uh, uh, you're doing a great job. I think, I think you will help a lot of people come to understand and, and use it just because of the smile on your face and your uh, energy that's there. Well, thank you. Mr. Searle, is, uh, am I to understand you have some Go Blue background as well? Or? I do, Go Blue. <laughs> I was born in Ann Arbor. My, my and Western Arbor. Michigan too? Western Michigan? Did, did, yeah, in uh, law school, yes, sir. Yeah, well. We can see the value of this, uh, this panel here. <laughs> Michigan. Um, well, like many others on this dais, uh, my uh, district is very rural, a lot of it, and uh, including myself. I have a smart TV. It tells me that every time I turn it on, but I can't use it as a smart TV. Uh, you can imagine the excitement of last week when I had uh, Chairman Pai in my district with me and talking about key issues and then going out to the field and seeing broadband stretch being stretched uh, right near my Harley Davidson dealership and out in the country as well and a matter of a few miles from my house. So I'm hopeful that soon I will be part of the real world and my hotspot and my MiFi won't be the only options that I have uh, to connect. Um, and those are issues we've been talking about, but um, um, uh, another bipartisan issue uh, that I, I want to address here and take note of is uh, something I've worked with Representative Clark, I see she's not there right now, uh, but a, a key issue called the Tower Act. And I think it goes to the issue of being able now to see more brand broadband and fiber being stretched and pulled because of a good economy because of good policies, I think we're developing together in moving forward. But we need to have people who, who will be a high-skilled workforce able to put up the internet for us and uh, understand that, that these can be excellent jobs, uh, lifetime jobs that have expandable opportunities to deploy fiber, 5G, uh, et cetera and that our uh, HBCU and minority populations need to understand that clearly. And Mr. Edmonds, you can help us with that extensively because we're talking about jobs that will be high paying but require in many cases less than a four-year education and allows for expanded four-year education if you want to do that. But putting up uh, uh, those resources, those towers, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Layton, as you noted in your testimony, some research has shown that low-income Americans or Americans with lower education levels who had access to the internet thanks to a temporary subsidy often choose to remain connected at its conclusion. I think, uh, Mr. Searle, you, you pointed that out as well. Uh, Dr. Layton, do you think that uh, principle would translate if we're able to increase the number of people in the workforce for deployment in these areas as well, simply by, by providing them exposure to broadband conceptually as well as higher incomes? The, the question is, what is it, the, the subsidy or the, or the training? Okay. The subsidy and, and ultimately the ability to hear and see and be involved and in understanding that it's now available to me. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The, you have the workforce issue. We have uh, described that for some people that it, it is an economic issue and that we need targeted subsidies for those individuals. And we also have skills gap to address. So I, I support those, those, those things. 
So in that, that line, Mr. Edmonds, I would also ask, I would, I would assume that if we get people to understand that this is for me now, and if we're going to put these in and they see the, the, the technology, the towers, et cetera, going into a neighborhood, that that's an opportunity for employment as well. It, it absolutely is an opportunity for employment. And one thing that I would like to you know, highlight with these, these are Americans who are really willing and ready to work and to participate in the economy. If they were extended a fair hand, they would excel in that. And of course, that's what we want to see. Um, my time has expired. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Our chair recognizes Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Searle, of the various programs your office carries out, um, can you talk about what your state, uh, how your state plays in digital literacy activities? Is that something primarily carried out at the state level or the local level? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's carried out mostly at the local level. Um, we have larger municipalities who have created digital inclusion um, uh, uh, working groups or collaboratives. But at the state level, we saw that work being done in some of our larger municipalities and through some of our universities. HBCUs was recently mentioned. North Carolina Central has an active program that, that helps uh, and serves Durham. Uh, and so um, what we did at the state level was we decided to get all those folks together for lunch one day, and we ended up creating the statewide collaborative to learn learn from them, and then to take what they've done successfully and try to, uh, what we call R&D, rip off and duplicate in other areas of the state, either municipalities or the rural areas. Rural areas are particularly challenging with this issue because they just don't have those underlying uh, resources or advocates like they do in the urban areas. Okay. All right. Well, in your testimony, you talk about how North Carolina is piloting innovative ideas to, to create sustainable solutions for broadband adoption. Can you give us a few uh, more specific examples of what those pilots may entail that uh, other states aren't doing? Sure, sure. And we received a grant f uh, from IMLS that, that I mentioned in my opening, and uh, it's $250,000. So that's important because we just didn't have the resources. I mean, we had smart people that were very charming and good at what they do, but without funding, we couldn't implement some of the ideas that we had. So uh, thank you to, to, to IMLS for that grant. It's a two-year grant program. And what we're going to do, the objective of that grant program is to create a playbook for librarians, basically something that we think we can scale not only across the state but across the nation. And so what we did was we set up digital literacy training and equipment and provide equipment to K-12 through students and families uh, at the local library, we partnered with the school that had a one-on-one -on -one program, so the student had a device, but maybe not connectivity at home. We provided them with a Wi-Fi hotspot or a cellular uh, hotspot, and then uh, they came in for six training sessions with their parents, and they sat down, and we did digital literacy training at, at the library with the computers there. Uh, the, the, the issue is sustainability after the grant ends, and how we uh, allow that librarian who is strapped for resources in the poorest of the poor counties in North Carolina to continue this program. And we're going to take lessons learned from that, and then we'll wrap it in, and we'll have it in our report, and hopefully we'll have that playbook out for everyone. So that's just one, one of the... Okay. Well, how important is sharing information on various broadband adoption initiatives through other state government channels? How important is that in improving broadband adoption, uh, the broadband adoption rate nationwide? It's critical. It's, it's, it's what we have now. The network that we have now is important. In 2015, when I started this job, we had 12 states that were part of what we call the State Broadband Leaders uh, Network that uh, works with NTIA to coordinate some of our meetings and monthly phone calls. Uh, today, there are 48 states involved. This is how active states have gotten just over that short period of time and how they see the need and how they can, uh, and they know now that they can lead, and so they're doing that. Well, I, I, I imagine using uh, the breadth of different community centers and state offices uh, provides a good platform to, to spread awareness of the different resources out there. So I commend you for, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, keep it up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't talk nearly as fast as my colleague Billy Long does, but I'll yield back the balance of my time, too. I thank the gentleman. Uh, seeing uh, no one else uh, looking for time, Chair requests the U.S. consent to enter the following into the record. A letter from Silicon Harlem, a letter from Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin, a letter from Chattanooga Mayor Andy Burke, a letter from Digital Equity.
Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, I would remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. And I would ask each witness to respond promptly to any questions that you may receive. Uh, at this time, the committee is adjourned. All right. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good.